Hello, my name is Dustin Carlson. I'm an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Gastroenterology uh, with the Esophageal Center of Northwestern Medicine. It was my pleasure to present this topic at the ASGE Clinical Symposium at DDW 2021. And the topic posed to me was regarding flip panometry on endoscopy and can it be a manometry alternative? So with the question being, can flip panometry be a manometry alternative? I think we can just get right to it. And the answer of course here is yes. But perhaps more appropriately, the answer is yes, sometimes. And the aim today will be to discuss utilizing flip panometry to evaluate the esophageal motility and when it can obviate the need for manometry, but also when instead it can be used as a complementary component of a comprehensive motility evaluation. To introduce the flip, flip is placed into the esophagus, typically at the time of sedated endoscopy, and utilizes impedance planimetry technology to measure the luminal dimension of the balloon attached to the distal end of a catheter. Within the balloon is also a pressure sensor that provides evaluation of the dimension pressure relationship, that is, the sensibility of the esophagus at the esophagogastric junction and the esophageal body as the balloon is filled in a controlled manner. And in addition to evaluating the sensibility, we developed the flip panometry technique that depicts the dynamic changes that occur related to the esophageal response to distension. The 16 luminal diameters along the length of the flip as well as the intrabag pressure are plotted over time and then interpolated to the color-coded diameter topography in a similar manner to how esophageal pressure topography is derived from high-resolution manometry. Thus, flip panometry evaluates esophageal distensibility of the EGJ, the esophageal body, dynamic EGJ opening, and the contractile response to distension, which is akin to secondary peristalsis. Further, our flip panometry technique was adapted into the real-time flip display that allows the assessment of esophageal desensibility and esophageal motility in response to distension at the time of endoscopy. And here's an example of this real-time display in an asymptomatic research volunteer. And we see normal EGJ opening, normal desensibility of the esophageal body, and this normal contractile response with this pattern of repetitive antegrade contractions, or RACs, which represent propagating secondary peristalsis that repeats due to the sustained distension created by the FLIP study. So how can this be applied in clinical practice? FLIP can be utilized with potentially as a manometry alternative per the focus of this talk as part of the EGD that would entail the initial diagnostic test for esophageal symptoms. If an objective diagnosis is reached on endoscopy, such as reflux esophagitis or a large hiatal hernia, stricture or EOE, a clinical diagnosis is reached and management can be targeted. However, if the endoscopy is normal or suggestive of motor disorder, and the plan is to pursue an evaluation of esophageal motility, flip panometry can be utilized right at the time of that initial endoscopy to evaluate esophageal motility. In some cases, the flip panometry may be sufficient to confidently reach an esophageal motility diagnosis and obviate the need for manometry. In that scenario, a management plan could be carried out or directed from the time of that encounter. However, other flip panometry findings may also direct the need for additional evaluation, which may include esophageal manometry. Notably, FLIP is also useful as a complementary tool. This is particularly relevant related to inconclusive manometries, such as the EGJ outflow obstruction classification on high-resolution manometry per the Chicago classification, a version 4 recommendations. Though when considering using FLIP as a manometry alternative, if barium esophagram is completed prior to EGD, these findings can certainly help set a pretest probability and facilitate confirming an esophageal motility diagnosis with flip panometry and potentially without the need for manometry during that initial endoscopy. On a side note here, there is a role for flip in EOE, and while not the focus of this talk, is another use for flip with potential promise. So just to review the flip study and protocol, performing the flip study is relatively simple and can be completed in about five to seven minutes at the time of sedated endoscopy. The flip study to assess esophageal motility requires use of the 16 centimeter flip balloon as opposed to the 8 centimeter balloon. The study protocol then involves performance of a stepwise volumetric distension protocol while the balloon is positioned uh, maintained at the distal esophagus and across the EGJ. Interpretation is flip volume fill directed uh, and has several factors for motility that can be assessed, including the contractile response pattern taken as the global impression of the 50 through 70 ml fill volumes and the metrics of EGJ opening. Generally, the EGJ distensibility index at the 60 ml fill volume and the maximum EGJ diameter achieved during the 60 or 70 ml fill volume. 
and will flip can generally be interpreted via the real-time pedometry display, the study also can be saved for future review, and an analysis program we've developed is available for free download at the website listed here. The flip evaluation of EGJ opening utilizes a metric called the EGJ Distensibility Index, or EGJDI, that is calculated as the cross-sectional area divided by pressure. Additionally, we apply the maximum EGJ diameter, which is the greatest diameter achieved during EGJ opening. When anti-grade contractions occur, EGJ opening is assessed at the anti-grade contraction associated peaks of EGJ opening. When there's not contractility, measures to avoid curl or LES contractions are taken. We recently proposed an EGJ opening assessment that jointly applied both the EGJ DI and the maximum EGJ diameter. In part, we derived this scheme to avoid some of the limitations that occur with HRM and the application of the IRP, i.e. a single metric with a singular cut point. Thus, when both EGJ metrics are distinctly reduced or distinctly normal, classifications of reduced or normal EGJ opening, respectively, are associated with functional classifications associated with a high degree of certainty. This does leave a borderline range in the middle in which some uncertainty persists, and in this scenario, complementary testing is likely warranted. And with regard to secondary peristalsis, specific patterns on the esophageal contractile response to distension are observed. We derived a scheme to be amenable to simple pattern recognition, but also to reflect a pathologic transition from normal to absent. Thus, when asymptomatic controls and the majority of patients with normal peristalsis on HRM will have a normal or borderline contractile response that includes antigrade contractions, the RAC pattern reflects right normal, while patients with abnormal primary peristalsis are more likely to have an impaired or absent contractile response. Additionally, there are other abnormal patterns and features, sustained non-propagating contractions, contractions of the LES in response to distension, or repetitive retrograde contractions that may reflect a spastic motor response. However, secondary reaction to mechanical obstruction or hiatal hernia is also a possibility here, thus we've labeled them as spastic reactive. Overall, and before we get into specific applications of FLIP, an important aspect to consider is esophageal manometry and FLIP manometry do measure different components of esophageal function. Manometry measures the response to swallows, while FLIP is measuring the response to distension. Also, HRM is measuring pressures, which generally require contact pressure on the catheter, whereas FLIP is directly measuring opening, which provides a more biomechanical assessment, such as distensibility. Thus, although FLIP and manometry have shared features related and have congruent FLIP and manometry findings occur in the majority of patients, there are times in which the responses may differ because of the different aspects of function. For example, differences in triggering of primary versus secondary peristalsis were previously demonstrated by seminal work from Richard Holloway and colleagues using manometry and focal balloon distension in studies that were performed 25 years ago. However, FLIP provides a valid evaluation of esophageal motility, and a notable application is related to the impact of a normal FLIP study. Included is the normal contractile response to distension that can be defined by the RAC pattern and further by the RAC rule of sixes. So six consecutive anti contractions of greater than six centimeters in axial length, and at a regular rate of six, plus or minus three, anti contractions per minute, which is a pattern that we observed in about 90% of asymptomatic controls, and essentially never in patients with achalasia. And thus, when we identified patients from our FLIP registry by findings of a normal FLIP panometry, which we defined by the RAC rule of sixes and normal EGJ distensibility, we found that the majority of these patients also had normal motility on manometry. The remainder had high resolution manometry findings of typically inconclusive or uncertain clinical relevance. These patients with EGJ alpha obstruction on manometry in particular almost all had normalization of findings on expanded HRM protocols, and those that completed esophagram were normal, and those would be classified as normal per version 4 of the Chicago classification. And very importantly, none of these patients had achalasia, nor were any treated with achalasia-type treatments. So in essence, the conclusion here is not that only 70% of these patients were normal, but that in actuality, nearly all of these patients had normal esophageal motor function. Because further, if we compare the HRM patterns of this normal flip patient cohort, see now on the left, it actually looked very similar to HRM patterns that were observed among healthy asymptomatic controls. The pie chart on the right represents data from a large multi-center study that pooled HRM data of asymptomatic controls. So overall, a normal flipanometry is associated with an exceptionally low probability to have a clinically relevant esophageal motor disorder. 
Next, to address achalasia, which is the most important esophageal motor disorder, and its identification is of utmost importance in the esophageal motility evaluation. We evaluated EGJ opening among a large cohort of more than 200 achalasia patients. This included subtypes 1, 2, and 3 defined by high resolution manometry, and the vast majority of patients with achalasia have reduced EGJ opening, or RIO, on flip panometry, while about a sixth had borderline EGJ opening, and thus may require additional testing to confirm the diagnosis. However, normal EGJ opening on flip panometry carries the potential to essentially rule out achalasia, and thus if the goal of your motility evaluation is to solely rule out achalasia, you may be able to proceed without manometry in this scenario. So to summarize achalasia, flip panometry is consistently abnormal in achalasia. In the setting of a high pretest probability for achalasia, such as a fitting clinical history, the endoscopic appearance that's suggestive, or perhaps a barium esophagram that appears like achalasia, flip panometry may be sufficient to confidently diagnose achalasia. Of note, if any component of the clinical evaluation leads to diagnostic uncertainty, the abnormal flip findings can instead direct toward obtaining a high-resolution manometry and or time barium esophagram and applying the, slip result, the flip results as complementary data. Though to take it even a step further, we've also evaluated to see if we could determine the HRM subtype of achalasia using flip panometry. And while we'll skip some of the technical details, we applied a supervised machine learning approach, and via application of flip panometry parameters, we were able, we were able to differentiate spastic from non-spastic achalasia, that is, HRM subtype distinctions that carry clinical management decisions, with 90 and 78% accuracy across training and testing patient cohorts. However, while achalasia patients will consistently have abnormal flips, it is essential to recognize that not all abnormal flips are achalasia. We recently published a study that specifically included patients with an HRM classification of normal esophageal motility that also completed flip panometry during endoscopy. Among this cohort, 73% also had normal EGJ opening on flip, and that left 27% with abnormal EGJ distensibility. However, all but five of these patients had borderline EGJ opening. Thus, herein lies an important application with FLIP in that although EGJ opening is consistently produced in achalasia, as we've seen, the patients in the study do not have achalasia based on their HRM findings. Thus, there are other factors beyond impaired LES relaxation that can cause reduced EGJ opening. An abnormal response to distension that involves contraction of the LES is likely a common factor here. And again, keeping in mind the difference between a response to swallows, as measured on manometry, and the response to distension, as measured on flip panometry. Further, as we evaluated secondary peristalsis in this group with normal primary peristalsis, we most frequently saw patterns with anterograde contractions, though 27% had impaired secondary peristalsis. And again, this is an observation that was previously made by Richard Holloway and colleagues in studies that evaluated secondary peristalsis with conventional manometry and focal balloon distension. However, also of note in the study was that among the 68 patients that also completed time barium esophagram, there was an association with esophageal retention and abnormal EGJ opening, even this cohort of patients with normal motility on HRM. So while this supports the potential of the clinical significance of the flip findings in this cohort of patients without achalasia, it is important to recognize that flip panometry findings need to be applied with the overall clinical context, and the pursuit of complementary evaluation should be pursued if there's diagnostic uncertainty. So finally, we can bring this together to classify esophageal motility on FLIP using the contractile response patterns and the classification of EGJ opening by conceptually applying probabilities of normal peristalsis, so high with racks, low with absent contractile response, and the probability of EGJ obstruction, again, high with reduced EGJ opening, low with normal EGJ opening. Also noting here that the spastic reactive group falls outside of this conceptual approach and thus these are flip findings that likely warrant correlation and further evaluation with manometry and or time barium esophagram. But in clinical application, the normal flip panometry pattern will effectively rule out achalasia and most major motor disorders, and thus management can target functional disorders or GERD, depending on the clinical scenario. Given the low probability for a major motor disorder of this pattern, this could potentially be a scenario in which HRM may not be needed. Next, the weak panometry pattern could reflect susceptibility to GERD and may be associated with esophageal hypomotility. Achalasia is likely ruled out with the normal EJ opening, but further evaluation of primary peristalsis may be warranted, particularly if anti-reflux surgery is being considered. Next, the non-spastic obstruction panometry pattern will most frequently include patients with achalasia. 
Thus, if there is a high pretest probability for achalasia, such as based on TBE and endoscopic appearance, this again is a potential scenario in which HRM may not be needed. Though if there is uncertainty or if other flipanometry features suggest spastic achalasia, HRM will help confirm diagnosis and with spastic achalasia, potentially help tailor myotomy length. Next, if there is reduced EJ opening but secondary peristalsis is present such that achalasia appears unlikely, this may reflect a potential subtle mechanical obstruction. Given that the flip is performed during endoscopy, this can prompt an immediate second look uh, endoscopically uh, for a potentially missed subtle stricture and may warrant considering performing dilation. Also recognizing that this does leave some gray areas with flip, such as with borderline EJ opening. In these scenarios, additional testing with manometry and or esophagram are generally warranted to complement the flip findings. And finally, if there is a spastic reactive response, this is a scenario in which these findings could be correlated with manometry and or time-bearing esophagram to help characterize spasm, as well as differentiate between spastic motility disorders or reactive findings, such as those related to hiatal hernias. So in conclusion, flip manometry can be a substitute for esophageal manometry in certain scenarios depending on the flip panometry findings. This can include a normal flip panometry given its association with a low probability for major motor disorders. This may also include abnormal flip panometry in patients with high pretest probability for achalasia. Important though is that indeterminate but abnormal flip panometry findings or if flip results are inconsistent with other clinical evaluation should direct pursuit of additional evaluation such as with high resolution manometry and or esophagram for complementary evaluation. Overall, because FLIP is completed during sedated endoscopy, it complements and enhances the diagnostic impression at the time of endoscopy. Further, this may be useful to direct endoscopic therapy or the subsequent management plan. With that, I'll conclude. Thank you all for your attention, and we'll welcome questions by email.